Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Casual Grimalist. As always, hello there. I'm your host, Simon Wilhelmans here, one of my writers. In this case, brand new writer. Thank you, Matthew. Matthew's put me together a script all about the bloody harps. He wrote this one on spec. He was like, Simon, I wrote you an entire script. <laughs> Do you want it? And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. Because normally people will email me or like, there's a writing, there's, there's ways. And uh, I'll be like, yeah, sure, write, you know, write me up a little sample. Let's see what you got. And Matthew's just like, I wrote you this whole thing. And I'm like, oh my God. And I click on the attachment thinking, oh, if it's not very good, then poor Matthew's wasted a ton of his time. And I'm like, Matthew, this is really good. So uh, I was like, yeah, I'll buy that shit for sure. Thank you, Matthew. Well, hello, Matthew. Please don't email me though. I don't want to encourage this in any way, <laughs> in general, as a rule. Please don't write me spec scripts. It's a terrible idea because 99% of it, I'll just be like, I'm sorry, this doesn't really fit with what I'm up to, which is code for it's not very good. Guys, sound like a bit of a dick, but it is the reality of things. And uh, Matthew, you just happened to uh, write something excellent. <laughs> It was a sweltering August in 1799 as a riverboat carried supplies from the east down the Ohio River and into what we now consider to be America's Midwest. I got friends from uh, Montana, and I've got this. There's this group of four of us, and it's me and these three American guys. <laughs> so I'm like definitely the odd man out, and they have all these American jokes that I don't get. And one of these American jokes is that they're constantly making fun of my mate for being from the Midwest. Even though he's from Montana, and he's always like, dudes, Montana is not in the Midwest, but this just riles those other guys up even more. They're from like, well, one of them's from Puerto Rico, and the other dude's from, I'm pretty sure it's Seattle, or he lived there for a very long time. He works for some big tech company. And he's like, and, and they just they just rip into this guy, and it, the more he protests, the more... The more they go into him, he should just stop protesting. That's the trick. Maybe we could sell the Midwest back to the French. Laden with hundreds of dollars worth of food, furs, and crafted goods, the sailors hoped to sell them for a much higher price than possible in America's larger and more developed cities. It may have made some great business sense, but there was one big obstacle to overcome. The portion of the river they traveled was a known hotbed of criminal activity. Several gangs of river pirates famously sailed those waters and often made camp along the river's bank, stopping and pillaging any vessel unfortunate enough to cross their path. By simply sailing the Ohio, the men were taking a massive calculated risk. If all went well, and there was a big if, they would arrive in a fraction of the time it would take to transport their goods by any other means. However, if things did not go well, they could lose much more than their cargo. That would be their lives, wouldn't it, Matthew? Death. Hilarious. As the sun reached its highest point in the sky, tensions on the boat were growing. Several miles back, what could have very well been a pirate was spotted camping along the northern bank in a peculiar spot. The crew had called out to him, but had not responded. Eventually, the man had faded into the distance, never once seeming to pay them any mind. Uh-oh. That guy. <laughs> He's definitely going down the river to be like, Boys! Our payday has arrived! Get ready to pillage! All had seemed fine up until that point, but now, further down the river, the craft was moving into a much more vulnerable position. The river was beginning to narrow, and the forests that pressed against the Ohio's mud-covered banks were giving away to rising rocky bluffs. At the same time, twists and turns in the water were forcing the craft to maneuver much more cautiously, while also cutting off visibility to what lay further downriver. The captain knew that if there was ever a perfect spot for an ambush, well, they were sailing right towards it. Uh-oh. <laughs> this way where you're like, turn around, turn around, sail up river fast! It's at this point you might be wondering why the crew didn't turn back for their own safety. Yes, indeed I was, Matthew. Where are you going? With luck. Forward. No! And it was for the simple reason that the ship they were sailing was physically incapable of doing so. Yeah, I mean, rivers flow really fast. I once went on a, I once uh, bought a canoe and went down a river. And we were like, yeah, let's try rowing back up the river. We could not. It's like the river was flowing really fast. And you're like, this is... We were just continuing to float down river. We definitely weren't making any progress up river. The only point of the oars was like roughly steer the boat away from rocks. That was the only point of the oars. <laughs> the boat would just... There's one way you could go. You can't row upstream. It doesn't work. The ship had no name, and that was because it was less of a ship and more of a giant raft. Known as a flatboat, the craft was roughly 6 meters wide and 20 meters long, with a flat bottom and no sails. That's a big raft. 
20 bloody meters? The cargo sat in the center of the raft, while the crew stood around its perimeter, guiding it with large oars and poles. Since it relied on the river's current to push it forward, the craft completely lacked the ability to sail upriver, and it had been built specifically for this journey, and if it were to make it to its destination, it would be deconstructed and its lumber was sold to be repurposed into homes, shops, wagons, and other essentials of the late 18th century. What did the dudes do? They're just like, yeah, I guess we'll stay here forever. I guess they could take some, like, wagons and shit out. They turn the boat into wagons and then ride back somewhere? It seems like, given they're a pirate, this sounds like a very risky decision, doesn't it? As for those aboard, the vessel was captained and crewed by the very owners of the cargo that they were transporting. Little more than farmers and craftsmen. Most of them had as much sailing experience as I do, which, I should mention, is absolutely zero. Matthew's sailing experience. I am an extremely accomplished sailor. That's, that's a lie. I used to know how to sail a boat. If someone showed me a boat these days, I'd definitely be like, I've no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> Just watch out when that big thing swings across, because you don't want to get clobbered by it. That's about what I remember about sailing boats. The most complicated part about sailing boats is putting all the sails together. Like, you'd arrive and it'd be like, okay, there's the sail. There's a bunch of ropes. <laughs> there's like there's these you've got to clip on. It's like, oh my god, I don't remember how to do any of this. <laughs> Once you get out of the water, it's it's... I mean, it's not... It, look, none of it is particularly uncomplicated. Just get a motorboat, for God's sake. I'm afraid I have no money. Now, as the men float down river, the gravity of the situation weighs heavily on each of them. None of them dare speak more than a whisper to one another out of fear of drawing the attention of anyone who might be waiting just out of sight. Well, dude, when your giant raft enters their sight, they're definitely going to notice you there, so you may as well make some noise, because it ain't going to make a difference. As the flatboat approaches a sharp bend in the river, the men plunge their oars into the water and begin carefully guiding it. As they round the corner, they see what awaits them on the other side. The river narrows and flows directly into an area where dozens of men armed with muskets, pistols, and knives line the banks on either side. <laughs> You're so f***. <laughs> At this point, one of the things I remember reading about pirates that is kind of like a departure from fiction to reality is that pirates didn't really like killing because the problem is then it's like if like Blackbeard and his crew were like, yeah, we're going to board your boat and uh, steal all your thing and then kill everyone. Then if that was their reputation, then every person on that boat is going to fight to the f death. They're going to be like, well, I'm dead anyway, so we may as well like absolutely just go for it. Whereas if they have a reputation of just stealing your stuff and then putting you on the life rafts or like putting you out on an island or whatever, then you're going to be like, all right, well, he's just going to steal our shit and then leave us in a lifeboat. So you're not going to fight back, which is a win for the pirates. So the pirates didn't typically just kill everyone. Where do you leave? Although I don't know if that's these pirates, so I'd be extremely nervous. The crew pull in their oars as they quickly try to arm themselves. Some reach for and begin loading muskets, while others draw blades and ready themselves to be boarded. A man from the shoreline orders them in a commanding voice to drop their weapons, but the crew does not comply. He then signals to his men, and several shots ring out. Musket balls fly through the air before tearing through fabric and flesh. A sailor grabs his chest before collapsing onto the deck. Several more fall overboard as others scramble to the rear of the raft looking for cover. The pirates throw grappling hooks and begin heaving the vessel towards the shoreline. Once it's close enough, several of the men cast aside their spent arms and ready their knives. They leap onto the deck and rush toward the remaining crew. The captain watches his crew members fall one by one as the pirates stab and slash their way closer toward him. Overwhelmed, he drops his weapons and throws his hands into the air. I surrender, he calls out. As he does, a large, hulking man with a raggedy hat and deep red scars across his face approaches. He wears a wicked smile as he presents his blood-soaked knife. This is really good, Matthew. I love this. Like, it feels like I'm reading a book. <laughs> the captain drops to his knees, begs for his life, but the man is undeterred. He grabs the captain by the collar and presses the blade to his neck. Just as he's about to end the man's life, a voice calls out from the shore, ordering him to stop. And reluctantly, he does. The captain looks up into the eyes of the man who would have killed him, and he's met with a hateful and burning stare. The man seems genuinely angry that has been called off. He calls for someone to bring him a rope, and moments later another man, smaller, younger, albeit sharing many of the same facial features, arrives with one. Together they bind the man before dragging him across the deck and tossing him into the mud. Moments later, they raise him to his feet and stand on either side of him. The three men watch as the pirate crew tear into the captain's cargo, all while dancing and singing to their good fortune. The captain 
who I have to believe was almost certainly feeling a tremendous amount of relief to be alive, had no way of knowing that on either side of him stood the outlaw brothers. Mikaja? Mikaja? Need to look that one up. Wow, you actually found a word not on four, though. I'm sorry, Mikajar, we're just gonna have to guess your name because it's not in the pronunciation dictionary, and I'm just... Not going to look much further in how to pronounce that. Together, the pair had used the chaos and confusion that was America's revolutionary war and its aftermath to commit crimes that were unheard of at the time. They had spent nearly 20 years terrorizing, robbing, murdering, and even enslaving citizens of a land that had been going through one of its most fragile time periods. This is the story of Mikajar and Wiley Harp, better known as the Bloody Harps. A Lonely Childhood as much as I enjoy writing about a group of river pirates famous for their swashbuckling, rum-soaked adventures, it's time to travel back in time to learn exactly why the captain would have been better off dead than in the hands of the harps. A natural starting point for any true crime story, yes. Despite how it seems so far, this is a true crime channel, and we will get to murders and all sorts of stuff like that, because that's what you sickos are here for. Uh, as with the killer's childhood, however, there's not an extraordinary amount of detail known about the brothers' early lives. Most sources focus on the crimes they'd later to commit, and that doesn't start until the Harps reach adulthood. Thankfully, what we do know is that the Harps grew up in a time and place that was very well documented due to other events that were occurring simultaneously. Knowing what we know about the importance of a child's formative years, these events would certainly go on to guide the brothers' political beliefs and prove invaluable context as we move forward. Well, their political beliefs, did they? <laughs> <laughs> this is another thing we don't often see in true crime things. I mean, other than the Ted Kaczynski episode, and that wasn't really political, that was more like terrorism. I don't know if philosophical is the right word, but you know, that was his beliefs. But not to something, why, why did they kill? Uh, politics. <laughs> okay. So, with all of that being said, I will now provide you with a brief history lesson. Forty years before the events on the Ohio River, a man and his wife, known only as the Hobbs, arrived in colonial America after spending months aboard a ship, braving the perils of the Atlantic Ocean. They, like so many others, had come to America in search of a better life, one filled with economic opportunity and political liberty. After landing on the coast of North Carolina in the fall of 1759, the Harps traveled roughly 150 miles inland to an area known as Orange County. Wait, 1759? When was the American Revolution? 1776? Political liberty. Ah! <laughs> Still under the foot of the British, aren't we, America? Ha ha ha. <laughs> Not for bloody long, though. <laughs> They secured a plot of farmlands on which to build their home and raise their future children. At first, the land seemed sufficient to provide them with enough food to eat and barter with. However, unbeknownst to them, the harps had arrived at the onset of a drought that would slowly devastate the area for the next decade. Year after year, they watched as the yields grew smaller and the fields more barren. The creeks that ran through their land dried up, the forests that once surrounded them died, and the neighbors with whom they developed close ties began to move away. No one would blame them for leaving, but the Harps were determined to stick it out. Over time, the area became increasingly impoverished as investors from wealthier coastal cities began migrating to the area and purchasing the infertile land for next to nothing. Bloody. <laughs> this is this is something that's so, like, <laughs> it still goes on today. Like, people from one area move to another. What do all the, is it the Texans complain about the Californians, like, just coming to Texas because they want to move there and like like elon musk and shit. like i don't know because california they were closing his factories and this this sort of stuff right and he's like i want to go to texas where it's truly free and it's certainly like there's pockets of the uk where it's like why is this place so expensive it's because oh, all the london people like to vacation <laughs> so okay hey what are you people doing we're gentrifying it's all good they used this land to establish trade routes and build general stores which sold everything from furs and crafted goods to fresh produce while it may seem that having a new source of food during a drought might be a good thing these stores caused a dynamic shift in the local economy the farmers who up till that point in relied mainly on a system of trading suddenly found themselves unable to match the new highly competitive prices and as a result found their buying power diminished faced with unprecedented hardship even more residents chose to abandon their homes and head further west however there were some like the harps who absolutely refused to be displaced they were determined to overcome these new challenges however conditions would not improve before long, those who remained in the area could only afford to do so by relying on loans from the very shops who were driving them deeper into poverty. This is not a good time. 
As, <laughs> so the shops move in. They start charging more. They ruin their little barter economy that's going on. And then they're like, yeah, don't worry about the high prices. We'll just loan you some money. You know what's going to happen next, don't you? It's like, oh, yeah, you owe us loads of money. What you can give us instead is your land, and then you can f*** off. <laughs> Do you not see this coming? Let's see how it goes. These loans were offered at ridiculous interest rates, and out of desperation, many residents had no choice but to accept them. When it came time to pay the bill, many found that they simply could not. <laughs> Eventually, the stores began suing to recoup their losses. They hired lawyers who used their superior knowledge of the law to win against the farmers who, more often than not, represented themselves in court. Most were forced to settle, using the only thing they had left, their lands. Shocking twist of events there, isn't it? This is not, again, this is something that's not changed. This has only got bigger. There's this amazing slash sad slash terrible slash neo-colonial style thing that goes on with uh, China. They have this big thing called the Belt and Road Initiative, where they basically loan countries a ton of money to build stuff. And they're not doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. There's this great, um, it's not Belt and Road. There's one for the oceans as well, they call it. It's got like a different name. String of Pearls, String of Pearls. And uh, the Chinese, they're like, yeah, yeah, hey, Sri Lanka, you don't have a lot of money to build a giant commercial port, do you? Would you like a giant commercial port? You could use it for trading with China. <laughs> And you're like, you're like, sure, 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 that sounds good. You can build this port. And we'll just, you know, and we'll, you can also loan us the money to build the port. And uh, we'll pay you guys back. And we'll just slowly pay you back from the benefits that this new port will bring. Turns out Sri Lanka can't pay back the loan. This was before they, uh, their, their government went bankrupt recently. This was a couple of years ago. So completely unrelated to that. And then Chinese are like, well, don't worry. You can uh, just give us the port and all of the land surrounding it. And that'll just be Chinese. Like, it won't be your land anymore, government. It'll be our land. And it's like, you, you, this, this was going to happen all along. And it's just crazy. Um, on a, this is obviously just on a macro scale of what we were just talking about. But it just blows my mind that this shit happens, like, in the 21st century. Colonialism is still real. And as a British person, I cannot judge them at all. <laughs> no, I can. I can and I do. To give you an idea of just how desperate the situation had become, by 1765, the number of yearly lawsuits brought against local farmers in Orange County multiplied by a factor of 16. If you're not going to leave, they're going to make you leave. This sudden redistribution of wealth led to a political shift as well. The new residents were firmly in favor of a colonial government as opposed to the British rule that the area was used to. Keep in mind that this is still an entire decade before the American Revolution, and while nobody was yet publicly calling for independence, there was much contention about the power the colonials actually had to govern themselves. The new arrivals elected officials who established a council that called themselves the Courthouse Ring. This council began passing new laws which raised taxes on the residents of Orange County, who by this point were beyond destitute. The residents were furious. Many did not recognize the authority of this new council and refused to pay the taxes. So, to enforce these new laws, the council appointed a group of sheriffs. These sheriffs were notoriously corrupt and would often demand more from the farmers than was actually owed. To add insult to injury, the wealthy, who could have certainly afforded to pay, they were able to simply bribe the sheriffs with a fraction of what was actually owed, and once they were in your pocket, they were more than willing to look past any embezzlement schemes or tax evasion that you might be unjustly accused of. This is so corrupt, isn't it? The Harps were among those most affected during this time, and they, along with dozens of other families in the area, began publicly calling for a more accountable government, one that would treat everyone equally, regardless of their social and economic standing. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, Harps, you're dreaming. That doesn't really happen today. And uh, you're living hundreds of years ago where governments were even more pieces of shit. And finally, without further delay, it was during this time of civil unrest that the focus of our story, Mikaja and Wiley, were born. In 1768 and 1770, respectively, the pair, like so many other children of the time, had to quickly grow up in order to survive a cruel and unjust world. Yeah, back in the day, I'd be like, how many kids do you have? 17. Why? Because I needed more laborers on my farm. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> I mean, it sounds so... It, even then, I'm saying, and I'm like, no, it does make sense, doesn't it? Like... I used to think that was insane, and I'm like, well, it makes perfect sense if you're living in the past, because you do need more laborers, and that's how you get them. They're basically your slaves until they're 18. <laughs> Can I say that? I probably can't say that. <laughs> this is getting better and better. But it's like, they have no agency. If you're under 18, you have to do what your parents says, legally. 
like if you were a slave and you were owned by someone else that's what you had to do legally crazy but i mean they're under 18 so they're not adults they can't make any decisions to date what am i talking about I'm digging myself a right hole here <laughs> christ simon just move on <laughs> you're comparing children to slaves <laughs> it's not okay as the sons of a struggling farmer, they most likely started working as soon as they were able to walk. By the time most children today would be entering elementary school, they would be expected to work long hours doing everything from tending livestock to picking what few crops the land had managed to produce. As time went on, tensions in the area continued to rise. More and more farmers were forced to stand by and watch as their neighbors lost everything. Knowing that something must be done, many began taking a more active approach. They threatened the lives of the courthouse ring, the sheriffs, the tax collectors, and even the judges. They vandalized local shops and turned away the incoming shipments that supplied them. This became known as the regulators' movement. I mean, normally all that stuff, you're like, well, they're just straight criminals. But when the government's terribly corrupt, you're like, I mean, I don't want to be, like, encouraging people to threaten judges, but when it's this... But then again, you could make arguments today that it's super f***ed up. Like, it's still f***ed up. And no one, like, rises up. Not don't rise up. Don't... I'm not trying to incite, like, civil disobedience or whatever. But I get why people are pissed off. Because it's, like, it's super corrupt. Things were escalating fast, but the residents of Orange County were not alone in this fight. The adjacent Anson and Granville counties were suffering under similar laws, and by 1764, the movement had gained the support of between six and 7,000 of the county's 8,000 total residents. <laughs> That's the vast majority. You need to start voting. Seeing the passion of the people moved the council. Finally able to understand the perspective of the common people, they realized their mistakes and agreed to step down. I already know that this is sarcasm. It's not like there's no like forward slash sarcasm or Simon read this in a sarcastic voice. It's just like this is just so unbelievable that it did happen. It did happen. A new government was elected for the people and the farmers had their land returned to them. The following years would prove that when we all stand together, the will of the people cannot be ignored. Okay, that last part didn't happen. Instead, North Carolina's provincial governor, William Tyron, commissioned an armed militia that sent a strong message by quickly detaining the movement's leaders. William Tyron? Sounds like this guy's name should be William Tyron, doesn't it? Ah, hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't America's history wonderful? The next few years are a fascinating time that I could spend literally hours writing about, but seeing as you're not here to learn about the minute details of an uprising that happened 250 years ago, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. Although, Matthew, if you want to write something for my War of Graphics channel, on there we do love to talk about uprisings for ages. You're hired. By 1771, after seven years of civil unrest, occasional protests, and some minor skirmishes, the regulators had developed a reputation as scoundrels and insurrectionists. The movement eventually reached its climax when regulators captured and imprisoned two of the governor's militiamen. The governor ordered the immediate release of his men, and when he was ignored, sent the bulk of his forces to put down the rebellion. Once and for all, the battle ensued, and in the end, approximately 16 men were killed, eight regulators, and eight of the governor's militiamen were in the ground, and public opinion was now completely against the movement. This is crazy. Like, back in the day, I mean, this is, I guess, America-specific, but these people would, like, rise up, and shit would happen. And now it's like the power of the government related to the people is so vast. The idea that there could be any sort of successful uprising against the government, that's not possible. I guess if everyone got together, it would be possible. But the idea of, like, a small uprising somewhere, it's like, no, well, they'll just deploy, like, the police. And if they don't work, they'll deploy, I don't know, like, arms police? Well, all the police are armed. They'll get the SWAT, the SWAT in there, FBI, or whatever. And if it goes really wrong, won't they just declare martial law and be like, well, now you're f***ed because the military's coming. And they're a lot more powerful than they've ever been in history. That they can basically control the world. You think they can't control a little rebellion? <laughs> no chance it's interesting just uh, i sound like some sort of crazy like prepper person but it is that the power of governments has got vast after achieving almost nothing and having completely lost the support of the people the regulators movement was officially over as an act of goodwill everyone involved excluding a handful of the movement's leaders were pardoned they along with three of the governor's officers who had been caught giving aid to the movement were hanged for their crimes Wait, what? Oh, okay. Excluding the leaders. So everyone was pardoned except the guys in charge, and they were all killed. <laughs> like, sent a powerful message. Don't be... You can join up. You can join up. But don't think about starting, okay? We're the government. Yeah? Well, I pay taxes, so the government. 
After receiving pardons, many of those involved with the movement opted to move further west into what is now eastern Tennessee. So after hearing all of that, you might be wondering to yourself, well, what the hell does this have to do with the harps? Yeah, I might have been, Matthew, but I was enjoying the story, so I was like, I was just letting it go. Well, fear not, because this history lesson is now officially over and I can explain how all of this relates to the two adolescents. As one of the few families who refused to be uprooted and because of their father's well-known support of the regulators' movement, the entire Harp family became the targets of harassment by the county's remaining residents. They were blamed for so many of the area's troubles and eventually the Harp name itself became associated with criminality and impropriety. And that would never lead, lead to more criminality, would it? It's like, this is the pro... I feel like we're talking about a lot of like politics here where I always worry I'm going to get myself into trouble. But it's like, yo, <laughs> if we like, if we have someone and we're like, you're a criminal, you're going to prison and you're going to be a criminal forever because we're going to keep a record of that. What the, the chance of that person just going down the straight and narrow dramatically removed because uh, reduced because it'd be like, well, you know, if there's two people and they're equally good applying for a job and one of them used to be a criminal. You're probably not going to hire the guy who used to be a criminal, right? And we can discriminate on that. It's not really even discrimination, is it? Because it's not what you chose to be a criminal, didn't you? As much as people choose to be criminals, a lot of it's obviously out of desperation of circumstance. But still, it's like we brand people like this. And it's like, of course, they're going to, it's going to be, they're going to, it's just self perpetuating criminality. Or not self perpetuating, perpetuating. Let's just move on, Jesus. This caused the boys to spend much of their chances isolated from those around them with only each other for company. It was during this time that they likely developed a deeply warped view of the world around them, as well as a codependency that would see them inseparable for their entire lives. As the brothers reached their teenage years, they began looking for work outside of their father's farm, but were disappointed by their prospects. Nobody in the town wanted to harp working under their employment. This is exactly what I was saying. And where does this lead? To crime. So McCarter, age 17, and Wiley, age 15, packed their bags and readied themselves to leave North Carolina altogether. They were done living under the shadow of their father's touted reputation or ready to make a name for themselves. So, dear listener, I must ask you now, what type of work do you think the young harps might have been drawn to? Could they be eager to learn a craft such as smiting or wig making? What on earth is smiting? Doesn't that mean, like, when you're smited by someone? To strike with a firm blow. Uh... Oh. Well, okay, I don't know what smiting means other than to strike with a firm... Does that mean, like, some sort of blacksmithing sh**? No, senor. No habla americano. Were they seeking formal education to become lawyers and defend those who, like themselves, had been trampled by the legal system? Or perhaps they simply sought to build their own farm and make an honest living the only way they knew how? <laughs> Get the feeling it's going to be none of these things, Matthew. Well, unfortunately, it was none of the above. The two teens had caught word of an extremely lucrative cash crop called tobacco, and they planned to secure jobs overseas on one of Virginia's many slave plantations. Well, that's not crime. I mean, back then. In order to make their journey more bearable, the Harps committed what I believe to be their first documented crime. Under the cover of night, the two teens traveled to a neighboring farm and stole a horse. Stealing horses back in the day was a big deal. Nowadays it'd be steal a horse. <laughs> you steal a horse today. I bet like 90% of horses that are stolen are just by drunk people. They're just like wandering home for the pub and they're like, it's that horse, I'm gonna f***ing steal that f***ing horse. <laughs> <laughs> but back in the day they'd f***ing hang you because it's like you know horse theft was like well it'd be like that's how people get around it's how they make a living and you were really depriving people of that i would say it'd be like stealing someone's car today but obviously they don't hang people for stealing cars why were horses so important i know there was a reason in the great grand scheme of things we're just tiny specks that will one day be forgotten I, it's got to be more than just transport right this was a crime that at the time carried an extremely harsh penalty to quote the law on first offense the convicted shall stand in the pillory for one hour and shall be publicly whipped on his or her bare backs with 39 lashes well laid on at the same time shall have his her or their ears cut off and nailed to the pillory holy shit. and for second offense shall be whipped and pillared in like manner and then be branded on the forehead in a plain and visible manner with the letters ht which i assume stands for horse thief um, well, at least you're still alive. <laughs> oh, look horrible. Although that drunk guy stealing the horse would be like, oh, what the f***? I did, do it. I did it again, didn't I? You just wake up, there's a horse in your guard. You're like, I'm going to get that branding now. God damn it. I didn't mean to steal it. I just had a few beers too many. While I understand that horse thievery was a serious crime at the time, I can't help but think that the very specific number of 39 lashes might be a bit of a disproportionate response. No sh**. 
Either way, sources dispute the next few years of the brothers' lives, and I find myself in the rare position of being thankful for a lack of historical record. I'm truly glad that I don't have to describe to you the duties and responsibilities of a slave overseer during the 18th century. Oh, so they were like, what job shall we do? Let's go be a slave overseer. Who's like, <laughs> you gotta be, that's, I mean, I, I don't know how things were in the past, but that's gotta be a job where you're a bit like, I imagine this is some dude with a big hat and a whip. Who wants that job? Sickos. All I will say is that I believe it speaks volumes about the mental state of the pair that out of all the jobs available to young able-bodied men at the time, they chose the one that would allow them to inflict as much misery as tolerated by the law on the country's most vulnerable people. Exactly. It was a position that required so much cruelty that, even in a time and a place that was famous for it, many people regarded it as a job that no honest man could ever perform. While we'll never know for sure what drew the boys to such extreme violence at an early age, the next time we see them, that violence will be fully realized. The American Revolution the 1770s were a busy time in America, to say the least. The regulators movement may have fizzled out without achieving its goal, but the settlement, sorry, sentiment of dissatisfaction that had driven it was spreading across colonial America like a virus. It's what happens when everything's super corrupt. <laughs> we don't know for sure whether or not the Hart brothers ever actually made it to Virginia, because the next time we see them, they're back in their home state of North Carolina. In 1775, roughly four years after leaving home, the brothers joined a gang of Native Americans who were known to kidnap colonial citizens in the northern region of the state. The gang would often hold their victims for ransom, during which time the female captives would be subjected a never-ending sexual assault by their captors. Since the newspapers at the time often attributed these crimes to the entire gang as opposed to individuals within it, we can't be sure as to the extent of the Harp's involvement. However, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that they, at the very least, were complicit by association. Now, look, if you're part of a gang and your gang is sexually assaulting women, then of course you're complicit by association. Just the question is, did it go further? And I think the answer would probably be, yeah. These were the same guys who like, you know what would be a cool job? Slave overseer. <laughs> probably not morally the best people that have ever existed. And by probably, I mean definitely not. For the next five years, it's reported that the gang would ride from town to town, charging through quiet farms like a pack of raging bulls. Wherever they went, only death and destruction was left in their wake. And you might now be asking yourself why someone in a position of authority didn't step up and put an end to this roaming gang of outlaws. But as it turns out, everyone was rather preoccupied with a little-known conflict called the American Revolution. And I mean, yeah, there's no American Revolution going on today, and fortunately, because of that, gangs have been completely eliminated. Which is brilliant news. By 1776, the colonies were in open rebellion against King George III, and the Harps found themselves surrounded by people calling for a complete separation from Great Britain. Those people were forming ragtag militias all across the land in an attempt to stand against the unparalleled might was the British Army. For the Harps, this was unthinkable. Seeing as they associated colonial rule with corruption and subjugation, they became fiercely loyal to the British Empire and would attempt to sign up to fight in their ranks. To the dismay, the brothers were rejected. Although the exact reason is not documented, I have to believe that it's possibly got something to do with all the rapes. Oh, yeah. understandable. Yeah. How would they know about that, though? Oh my god. But that didn't mean the Harps were completely useless to the British. For the next few years, they and their gang would travel alongside the British army, raiding the homes of anyone they believed to be harboring pro-patriotic sentiments. Their goal in these raids was simple, absolute devastation. After slaughtering the home's inhabitants, they would rob it of its valuables before setting fire to the fields. They didn't just want to kill, they wanted to send a message. Stop supporting this pointless rebellion, or else. The British army and its leaders were more than willing to look the other way, so long as the focus of the gang's aggression continued to be directed to the right targets. They were encouraged to operate within the no-man's land between the British and American armies, and if things got a bit too dicey, they were permitted to fall back behind British lines to relative safety. As an American, I'd like to say that this kind of thing was not tolerated by our side, but the truth is similar gangs supporting patriotic forces were also operating within the area with the blessings of their own military leaders. Uh, okay, what a surprise, both sides were up to some shady sh where they got people who really weren't technically tied to them to do the sort of dirty bits of war that um, the, 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 the officials didn't want to do, which uh, again, 
fortunately has been completely eliminated in today's warfare and there's there's no longer any private military contractors who are up to some shady ass shit when the uh the regular military doesn't want to get its hands dirty it's great we've eliminated that along with gangs right these american and british backed gangs would often engage in minor unsanctioned battles of their own while the real armies fought nearby by 1780, after committing five years of unpunished crimes and atrocities, an officer was so impressed with the brothers' fighting skill that they were admitted into the British Army as volunteer soldiers. As volunteers, the brothers were not provided uniforms, food, or weaponry of any kind. They were expected to survive by continuing to loot active battlefields and homes in the surrounding areas. That sounds like a deal. It's like, yeah, yeah, you can come into the army. There are absolutely zero benefits. And you have to do everything yourself, so kind of just like before. Thanks to the records of British troop movements, we have a pretty good idea of the brothers' whereabouts for the next few months. They would continue to fight for the British during several key battles, including the Battle of King's Mountain in October 1780, the Battle of Blackstocks in November, and finally, the Battle of Cowpens in the following year. I, it is interesting, and I think I've brought this up before, maybe not on this channel, but on like other history stuff that I do. I've never heard of any of these battles. I know very little about the American Revolutionary War because, and Americans, I, I, I don't feel they are surprised by this, but I remember it was like on Quora or whatever, you know, one of these websites where you get sucked in and end up reading things forever. But someone was explaining like, yeah, the British, we don't really study. We don't know about, you know, it's like, oh yeah, there was an American Revolutionary War and then America was no longer a colony. But this was just like one part of our history. It wasn't the formation of a nation. It was like, yeah, there were lots of colonies and well, they eventually all got independence, whether through war or us just being like, you know, you can have it back or like, I don't know. Again, not really super knowledgeable about this this stuff in history, but it's just... Like, I don't know any of these battles, which is kind of weird because you're like, oh, yeah, the British are fighting the Americans. These are like two important countries. One is one important country and one is a small island in Europe. <laughs> but you know what I mean? You'd expect it to be like, I'd expect myself to know more about this, but I don't. By the middle of 1781, the British were beginning to suffer major defeats at the hands of the Americans, and troop morale was at an all-time low. The Harps were beginning to grapple with the unthinkable idea that an American victory may be on the horizon. If that were to happen, it would mean an end to any immunity that they had enjoyed thus far. If the Americans took power, the brothers would inevitably be brought to justice and almost certainly executed. And so, the Harps began planning a trip to East Tennessee to the same area that many residents of Orange County had migrated to after the dissolution of the regulation. There they hoped to find like-minded individuals who shared their same hatred of the colonial government. The Harps began readying themselves to travel, but discovered one thing was missing. They needed wives. Okay. <laughs> Why? Now they think for a second that either Mikaja or Wiley were the romantic type because to them marriage was just a logical next step, and because the Harps had no interest in the long and tedious process of courting the women of their dreams, they instead chose to simply kidnap and enslave the next ones they came across. You men are so similar in your mediocrity, you're like- Surely that wasn't allowed. I, I mean, I, I know the past was the worst, but surely that wasn't allowed even back in the day. Or do I am just like, am I giving the past way too much credit? I mean, probably. In the following days, the brothers set their sights on a group of women whose husbands were away fighting on behalf of the Americans. One evening, as the sun was setting, they sat upon the women's home and captured them. They bound their wrists together using rope and escorted them by gunpoint to the direction of their camp. Fortunately for the women, Captain James Wood of the Continental Army happened upon the group as they traveled, recognizing that the women were in trouble and having the wherewithal to actually do something about it, Wood confronted the harps and ordered that the women be released. The harps responded by firing their muskets at him. After taking cover, he returned fire, managing to hit Wiley square in the chest. The younger of the harps fell from his horse and landed with a solid thud in the dirt below. Mikaja rushed to him, releasing the rope that held the women in the process. Wood was able to usher the women to safety, but by the time they returned with a group to capture the harps, they had already fled the area. Oh boy, getting shot in the past. I mean, getting shot today... I'm sure is absolutely no picnic. But getting shot in the past is like you survive their bullets. Like yeah, you just gotta have your fingers crossed for weeks that you don't get infection from doctors. You have no idea what they're doing, and they're like, "Oh, there's a bullet in there. Let's poke around, shall we?" His brother's probably like, "Let me get it. Let me just poke around it. Oh my god, there's so much blood. <laughs> Let's just dry it off with some sand or some dirt." It's like, "Oh, are you to stop, stop. There's gonna be infection." I always think like it's one of those thoughts that you come back to. Like if you were transported back in time. 
Like, what could you do that would blow people's minds? And one of my big ones was like, well, microwaves would be awesome. Like, to go back in time, be like, yo, 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 microwaves. <laughs> Amazing piece of technology. But the biggest one, I feel, would be like, yo, stop sticking your hands in wounds for f**k's sake. Please wash them first. That alcohol thing you like drinking, wash your hands in that. And then stick your hands in the person if you have to. And please don't. Just first thing, don't. Leave the bullet inside. Please. No hands. Just cover the wound as quickly as possible. With something clean. <laughs> and you're like, I know it's going to sound crazy. I know it's going to sound absolutely mental. But if you want to stick something inside someone, put it in boiling water for a while first. I know. Mad, right? Totally mad. But just do it. Trust me. We'll see some results. And there would be statues of me everywhere. <laughs> With his wounded brother in tow, Mikaja rode hard toward the nearest British holdout. While the wound would prove to be non-lethal, miraculously, it would cause Wiley to suffer chronic pain for the remainder of his life. After several long months of recovery, Wiley was once again able to travel and the brothers began preparing to head west. Though before doing so, Mikaja insisted that they get revenge against the man who nearly ended his beloved brother's life. The pair traveled to the home of Captain Wood but were disappointed to find that he was not home. They were, however, pleased that his daughter Susan was. Oh God, Mikaja decided right then and there that since Wood had allowed his previous wives to escape, he would take the man's own daughter as his bride. Susan resisted but was easily overpowered by the two brutish men. So together, the pair escorted Susan away from the home, bound her arms and legs, and forced her to watch helplessly as they burned her father's home and slaughtered his livestock. When they returned, Mikaja pulled the women onto his saddle and the three of them set off. In order to find someone for Wiley, the brothers made a camp outside of the town nearby and, when nightfall came, kidnapped a woman named Maria Davidson. Over the course of the next few days, the men made it perfectly clear to their new wives, and I use that term as loosely as possible, what was expected of them. Susan and Maria were to cook, clean, and eventually, when they reached their new home, provide them with children. Any perceived slight against either of them was met with extreme brutality. More than once, the women were beaten to unconsciousness while attempting to adjust to their new lives. This is super f***ed up. What's going on past? Finally, having found marital bliss, the Harps began their journey west. For the first few weeks, the group of four would travel alone. However, eventually, they came across several men who were headed in the same direction. Those men, who had apparently no qualms with the brothers' obvious captives, found the Harps to be great company and suggested that they all travel together. The brothers agreed, and for the next few days, everything was totally fine. All of that changed when one of the men, Moses Doss, began to become concerned for the health of the brutalized women. While witnessing McCarthy, to inflict a particularly savage beating upon them, Doss decided to intervene. He walked up to Mikaja and pulled him away, ordering him to stop. This is not going to end well for you, my dude. You are going to die. I mean, good for you, but he's going to murder your ass. Mikaja turned to Doss and allowed his rage to be directed at the man who had dared to tell him how he should discipline his own wife. He wrestled the man to the ground and, as the rest of the group watched, began delivering blow after blow to the man's face until he was completely unrecognizable. After exhausting himself, Mikaja stood up, unlatched his pants, and urinated on the man's corpse. Oh my good god. He literally beat him to death and then pissed on his body. That's some f***ed up. And this guy's basically for being a bit of a hero. Even though at first he was like, no, it's cool, you and your captive wife, we're just hanging out. And then it's like, you took it too far. That's called courage. But he is dead. But still, this guy's a relative hero, and uh, his corpse was pissed on. Holy s***. Now for the first time, Susan and Maria witnessed firsthand what the captors were capable of. Did it really come as a shock to you? You've been beaten to unconsciousness by men who kidnapped you. I mean, I know there's nothing you could do about it, but you were probably aware that they could be murderers. They watched in horror as Mikaja and Wiley used a knife to split open the man's chest. Mikaja removed the man's organs as Wiley gathered large stones from a nearby riverbank. What the f***? Okay, now I get what you were meaning, Matthew. At first I was thought, wait, you, you, they must have known that they could be killers. And now I see what he's talking about, because this is... What are you doing? Why are you removing his organs? Together they loaded the stones into the man's empty chest cavity before tossing him into a nearby river. This method of body disposal would become a common staple of the brothers' murders. Why? What the f*** are you doing? Why would you do this? It just sounds messy and weird. Unsurprisingly, after witnessing the death of their friends and fearing a bit about the whole situation, the remaining men soon parted way with the hops. 
I bet that wasn't uncomfortable to be like, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been lovely hanging out with you chaps. We're just going to, uh, we're going to go down this completely other direction in the opposite way. In fact, the way we came just, but it's been fun. It's been, oh my God, please, let's go. Among Friends. As the tides of the Revolutionary War were beginning to turn, the Harps began hearing rumors among their Native American allies that a town had been founded to the west that was so remote, many thought it to be undiscoverable without having specific directions to it. Fortunately for the Harps, a former gang member had provided them with just that. Situated in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains near what is now Chattanooga, the town of Nickajack awaited. It's quite a name, isn't it? It, along with four other villages, made up what was known locally as the Lower Towns. These towns were located along an unnavigable stretch of the Tennessee River and surrounded by thick and confusing forests. Sometime around the beginning of the Revolutionary War, a group of Native Americans under the leadership of a man named Dragging Canoe had broken away from the Cherokee tribe in order to found a settlement of their own. This group had rebranded themselves the Chitter Chick Chick Amalgans, Chickamalgans, and they were notoriously violent toward the settlers that occupied the surrounding areas. <laughs> so, I'm always like, I feel like the whenever I hear something, I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> These dudes arrived, and the Native Americans are like violent towards them, invading their lands. <laughs> what a surprise! Under this new name, the Chickamaugans spent over two decades carrying out countless raids, destroying thousands of homes and killing over 400 settlers in an attempt to drive the invaders from their lands. Like the Harp's previous gang, the Chickamaugans and their crimes are often completely ignored and even frequently encouraged by some British officials looking to inflict as much grief on the troublesome patriots as possible. Due to its reputation, the settlement became known as a safe haven for outlaws, British spies, runaway slaves, and even renegade members of other nearby tribes, such as the Shawnee and Muscogee. When the Harps arrived, the Chickamaugans welcomed them with open arms. Their reputation as British loyalists and adept fighters had preceded them. They were immediately granted permanent residence among the tribe and given land on which to build a new home. Over the course of the next decade, the brothers would prove themselves invaluable. Due to their fair complexion, the Harps were able to act as spies for the Chickamaugans, who often found themselves stonewalled by the already distrusting settlers. They traveled from town to town, learning the land and ingratiating themselves with its inhabitants, after which they would send word to Dragon Canoe, informing him of the optimal time to attack. <laughs> it's kind of the, the past. It's like, why do we trust these? Because they're white. That's why we trust. They're, they're not British and they're not Nate. They must be our friends. How could anyone betray us? However, not satisfied with the dull duties of a scout, the Harps were more than eager to get their hands dirty when the time came. Along with raiding parties, the brothers would slash, stab, and shoot anyone not fortunate enough to escape their wrath. One important distinction to note is that while the Chickamaugans viewed these raids as retribution for the many injustices levied against their tribe, the Harps were known to take a sadistic pleasure in the capture and torture of their victims. Mikaja, who was far more violent and ill-tempered than the younger Wiley was known to enjoy coming up with uniquely horrific ways to inflict as much pain and humiliation on his victims as possible. During these raids, Mikaja learned and would later employ the delicate art of scalping as a way to frame Native Americans for his crimes. For those of you who may have heard the term but don't know the full gruesome details, well, let me guess. I mean, I'm vaguely aware of it from like, but it's removal of the top of the head, right? That's a bingo! So like just the scalp is like cut off and then it's like you kill they know you killed a man because you know back in the day even today it's like someone's not going to survive with the top of their head cut off right like the the you can't just have a skull that's not going to work Scalping is the act of separating a person's skin and hair from the top of their skull using a knife or sharpened sword. Well, joke's on you with me, isn't it, then? I'm bald. They'll be like, we don't want that weird bald spot. However, those wishing to inflict as much pain on their victims as possible would often start off the process with a knife before finishing it by tearing away the main flesh with their bare hands. Oh, that's gonna hurt. Dude, that is not right. This entire process was often done while the victim was both alive and aware of what was being done to them. Almost died during the process or immediately after, those less fortunate live for hours or even days afterwards. There are some reports, although rare, that people survive for months or even years before inevitably succumbing to an infection in their exposed skull. Yeah, you can't rock around with an exposed skull. That's not going to work long term. 
or even short term, apparently. At some point while living in Nickajack, Susan and Maria would each give birth to two children. Since the brothers were known to share their wives with another, it's not known for sure which fathered each of them. The brothers would regard this time as the happiest of their lives. They were surrounded by outlaws who, like themselves, had no qualms with murder, rape, torture, or any number of other unthinkable crimes. Their captive wives and children had settled into their new roles, even though they were most certainly miserable they didn't dare voice it and finally most importantly they were free of the scourge that was the american government but like all good things it would all soon come to an end in the fall of 1794 the harps were speaking with an associate from a nearby town when they learned troubling news several groups of land surveyors had recently gone missing in the area and it was making investors from back east nervous concerned that no more territory could be settled west of the appalachians until the chickamaugan threat could be dealt with the u.s government had begun deploying scouts to the area to identify any and all threats. Even more concerning was the fact that not only had these scouts successfully discovered the exact location of Nickajag, but that the U.S. Army under the command of Colonel Whitley was currently rounding up volunteers to move in and lay siege to the entire area. On the following day, there is some sort of social commentary to be made on the fact that after two old decades of allowing the lower towns to ravage the area, the one thing that finally got someone's attention was the fact that they might be driving down property values on land that the US government had yet to acquire. Once again, I ask you, isn't American history wonderful? <laughs> Fearing that sending word to Dragon Canoe might cause Colonel Whitley to mobilize his forces sooner than expected, the Harps opted to quietly return home, gather a few of their belongings, and escape under the cover of night as to not cause a panic, seeing as uh, they would need to move quickly. They were only able to bring with them what could be loaded onto their horses or carried in their arms. The following day, a militia of over 500 volunteer soldiers, most of whom were family members of the gang's previous victims, stormed the town at dawn. They were out for revenge, and they would have it. When you've got 500 volunteer soldiers going after you for revenge, it's like you know you're a bad dude. Duh. You, you've made a lot of enemies, and they all want to murder you. The Chickamauguans were caught completely by surprise. They had heard nothing of an attack and thus had been given no chance to repair fortifications, arm themselves with anything that might have given them a fighting chance. Chaos ensued as the forests and bluffs that had once been the town's greatest defenses now obscured those who rained volley after volley of musket fire onto the town's inhabitants. Surrounded by soldiers on one side and pressed against the Tennessee River on the other, many began retreating across the river, but most were unsuccessful. Wait, what does that mean? They drowned in the river? Is it so hard? I always wonder about this. Like, is it that hard to swim across the river? Like, look at big rivers, like in cities, and it's like, yeah, it looks fairly fast moving. I'm a pretty strong swimmer. I reckon I can make it across the river. And then you hear, oh, this is like, well, the Tennessee River, I don't know, this is America, everything's really big. And then you get those massive rivers, which are like seas. They're so wide. I remember when I was in, I was in a country called Laos in Asia, and it's like, there's this off massive river like down in the south and it's like it just gets so wide and you're like taking a boat on this river and then it's like wait are we going up river or are we crossing the river what's going on because it's just massive and there are like tons of islands in the river and stuff it's incredible a soldier present that day was james collier and he would later write the following we dashed through the cornfields to the upper ends of the town the indians had deserted their cabins and fled to the river several were killed in the river one was laying on his face in a floating canoe reaching his hands over his side and paddling several shot at him i fired two or three times and at length colonel whitley came up and said let me have a crack at him i saw the blood spurt out of the indian's shoulder and he made no more efforts. Oh, I see. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be able to make it across the river either if someone had shot me, would I? <laughs> so that's what happens. By the time the siege had ended, anywhere from 50 to as many as 200 Chickamaugans had been killed. It's reported that so many died while trying to cross the river that the waters of the Tennessee had briefly turned red with blood. As for the Harps and their wives, they were long gone, though probably still close enough to hear the muffled cries of those they had left to be slaughtered. The Spree A few months after fleeing Nickajack, the Harps, now in their 30s, arrived in Knoxville, Tennessee, where they attempted to forego their illegal activities in favor of a fresh start. Really? How long is that going to last? I mean, this section is titled The Spree, so I'm going to guess not very long. And in fact, instead of going into legal trade, things are going to escalate rather dramatically. However, this was short-lived. 
shocking news as just months after arriving the brothers were accused of murdering a man named johnson after his body was discovered washed up on the banks of the tennessee river the corpse had been mutilated and filled with stones but had failed to fully sink into the water pro tip here criminals don't fill a body with stones don't have a calling card that's a better one don't have a calling card as a murderer because it's just going to tie all of your murders together and make it easier for you to be caught and tracked down and then prosecuted for all of your individual murders obviously come on get it together use your small brains for just a few seconds okay. the citizens of knox county organized a posse and went to confront the harps however as they could not be located unable to return to north carolina and fearing that they could no longer stay in tennessee the harps fled north through the cumberland gap and into kentucky believing a posse to be right on their tail the brothers attempted to travel as quickly and as inconspicuously as possible at least two more men a merchant named peyton and a traveler whose identity is unknown were found dead in the harps wake both men had been disemboweled and their throats had been cut seeing as they were now wanted men the harps sleep deprived and lacking all basic necessities became erratic they barely slept refused to stay in one place for longer than a few days and continued to murder anyone they came into contact with after all any rogue traveler might be tempted to point the authorities in their direction and that was a risk that they could not tolerate once again the brothers met and killed a man for his supplies but this time they also took the time to sever the man's head from his body later that year they crossed paths with two impoverished travelers from maryland despite having nothing of value on them the harps killed and mutilated them anyway this served no purpose other than to feed the brothers appetite for violence by december they started to feel like the heat finally might be dying down after months on the road moving at an unsustainable speed through some of the country's roughest terrain they checked themselves into an inn and prepared to ride out the winter unsurprisingly someone noticed that as soon as the harps arrived people and the valuables mysteriously started disappearing one person let's start, i wonder who's up to this nonsense one person in particular was john langford langford had arrived from virginia and was staying at the same inn as the harps when his body was discovered the innkeeper accused the harps but they fled before they could be confronted on the run again the harps were forced to travel through freezing temperatures and icy snowfall as they made their way further north only this time they really were being pursued a collection of residents followed them day after day until finally after being caught off guard the harps were apprehended and imprisoned in danville kentucky is this this is the first time that they've been to prison right which is mental this however is not the time for celebration because a few short months after arriving the harps would lead a revolt to escape captivity oh no come on now escapees the harps reunited with their families who i have to believe were suffering from a severe case of stockholm syndrome and continued their journey north not just stockholm syndrome they're probably beating the shit out of their families to make their it's like they're scared they're like battered it's not like it's f-ed up but this is like again this is one of those problems that has not been solved i know as you know the, my previous jokes about like we've solved gang violence and stuff because there's no war or whatever but it's like yeah also like wives stay with abusive husbands which is and i'm sure on a much lesser scale much lesser scale the other way around we don't want to forget that and it's like people do and it's mad but they do don't do that leave F-ing leave it's better if you leave and go to the police do it do it growing increasingly impatient with the harps antics the governor of kentucky james garrett placed a bounty of 300 dollars on the brothers heads this not insignificant sum brought forth every bounty hunter in the area and sent them directly on a collision course with the harps mikaja wiley and their wives and children moved quickly throughout the kentucky forests carefully avoiding the main roads and once again leaving a trail of dead bodies in their wake two men edmonton and stump recognized the brothers but were captured and killed before they could raise the alarm it was during this time of hot pursuit that mikaja did the only thing he'd ever claimed to feel regret for with bounty hunters closing in and sarah no longer able to comfort her infant child in the freezing conditions mccarger grew enraged and without thinking bashed his own daughter's head against a nearby tree dude knowing the strength that mccarger possessed the child most likely died instantly and without suffering but that doesn't take away the image from my mind or mine neither matthew <laughs> the harps buried their daughter and continued on racked with grief and suffering from exhaustion mccarger blamed the posse pursuing them as the main cause of his daughter's death guess what mccarger they're not f-ing responsible you are because you f- murdered your daughter you bell end when he learned the name of one of the men leading the group the harps took the time to seek revenge the only way they knew how they found and captured the man's adolescent son they murdered and dismembered his body before leaving it as a warning for his father to find guy you're a real piece of shit, guys you're real pieces of shit. 
Unsurprisingly, this did not help their situation. The posse continued pursuing the harps. Yeah, you'd see that and be like, I'm, 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 nah, I'm gonna murder you and I'm gonna torture you to death. I'm, not, I'm gonna do that scalp thing where I just cut a little hole and then rip your face off. I'm upset. Louder! I'm upset. Louder! That's what, he, that's, that, that's gonna feel pretty good to him. That, that revenge is gonna be sweet. The posse continued pursuing the harps and even used the boys' murder to gain sympathy from other locals who joined in the pursuit. The brothers' plans had backfired at every turn and they knew that the walls were closing in around them. If they ever wanted to rest easy again, they would need to align themselves with a gang that was either numerous enough or notorious enough to deter those following them. The brothers needed to find a new knickerjack. They needed to find Sam Mason. Safe at last. Sam Mason and his gang, known simply as the Sam Mason Gang, were river pirates who operated out of a natural rock formation creatively named Caven Rock. Imaginatively naming may not have been their strong suit, but that didn't take away from the fact that this gang's name carried the exact notoriety that the Harps so desperately needed to back them. With the posse closing in, the brothers arrived at the Ohio River, crossed it using canoes, and traveled along its northern bank until they stumbled across three men. They killed the men and disposed of their bodies in the usual manner. Disembowel, fill with stones, sink in the river. Guys, come on. Don't do it. Oh, you're gonna get caught because of this. I mean, not because of this, but what are you doing? Finally, after days of search in the area, the brothers' gamble paid off. They were approached by a group of men on horses who they soon learned were members of the very gang that they had been seeking. The travel-weary and battered harp family followed the men back to their hideout to meet with the famous pirate. As far as cold-hearted murders go, Sam Mason was a real stand-up fellow. He was unable to turn his back on a family with three young children seeking refuge, and the harps were permitted to stay within the camp and were given ample space on which to settle. In addition to this, the harps learned that their plan had succeeded. Unwilling to tangle with Sam Mason and his seasoned crew of killers, the men pursuing them had stopped just short of crossing the Ohio and soon after disbanded it had taken everything they had but the harps had finally done it after a year on the run they could sleep tight knowing that they were among friends however not all was well as the harps would soon discover their new friends were not of all the same caliber they were used to sam mason himself was unlike mccandra and wiley in almost every way while the brothers were dirty crude and downright ugly mason took pride in his appearance and was described as a fine-looking modest and unassuming man. Furthermore, Mason did not harbor the same anti-American sentiments that the Harps had vehemently clung to for their entire lives. In fact, Mason had been captain of the Ohio State County Militia during the Revolutionary War, fighting alongside colonial forces. The final and most divisive difference between the two were that Mason and his crew absolutely did not take pleasure in killing. Sure, the killing was an expected part of the job and they had killed hundreds of innocent people over the years, but not one among them took the same sick pleasure that the brothers did. They never killed without reason and often would take and release hostages so long as they surrendered peacefully. The first sign of trouble was when the Harps met and murdered a group of innocent travelers for the simple pleasure of it. This senseless act drove a wedge between the harps and mason who was being pressured by those under him to expel the harps from their camp they believed that the harps could not be trusted and that it was only a matter of time before they turned on the gang yeah it's not really surprising is it it's like in every way these are bad dudes they murder people for fun they're probably not trustworthy in any way expel them from the gang sam come on sam Mason began to think of the Harps as brutes and butchers, while the Harps grew to despise Mason and his gutless crew, perhaps even hate them. However, even they were smart enough to resist further agitating those who outnumbered them 20 to 1. Reluctantly, the brothers agreed to respect Mason's wishes by agreeing to keep the killing to a bare minimum. And now we arrive back where our story began. Perhaps now, after knowing exactly who the Buddy Harps actually are, you might be able to fully appreciate the situation the riverboat captain found himself in. However, they just seem to have been reined in by Mason, so they're probably better off than having found it a few months earlier when they were all still really, you know, killing a lot for fun. As I said, he stands and watches as the Sam Mason, Sam Mason gang tear happily into his cargo. He holds his, ah, the guy who runs on and is about to kill the captain of the raft is uh, one of the harps. And Sam Mason is the guy on the shore being like, hey, no killing. I told you. Legend. Murderous, terrible legend.
As I said, he stands and watches as the Sam Mason gang tapple into his cargo. He holds his tongue as they carelessly step on the bodies of his men. He looks up to the harps on either side of him. The one to his right towers over him, while the left presses the tip of a dagger painfully into his side. The brothers may be silent, but on the inside, Macadro was fuming. Mason had no right to call him off. He hated Mason for it, and wanted nothing more than to crush the man's pretty little neck. He looks to Wiley and gives him a nod. This wasn't over. Not by a long shot. After the captain had been transported back to Cave in Rock and the goods from the raft safely unloaded, the gang took on the laborious task of disassembling the flatboat. Once that was done, the men returned to the cave to commence with the celebration. Food had been prepared and alcohol was being passed around freely. The crew wasted no time. Before the sun had even fully set, Sam Mason, along with his entire crew, were drunk on the spoils of the victory. They sang songs and toasted to each other's health. The harps uninterested in anything but the man who had cheated death, stood on the clearing above the cave, cursing Sam Mason's name. Beside them sat their prisoner, hogtied and starving. They ate and drank in front of him, taunting the man as they did. The more Mikaja drank, the angrier he felt. Eventually, that anger grew until it could no longer be contained. Mikaja and Wiley untied the captain and ordered him to remove his clothes. At first, he resisted, but with the threat of a knife, he was eventually persuaded to comply. The brothers shoved the captain to the ground and urinated on him. They fetched a horse from the camp's stable and ordered the captain into the saddle. Once the naked captain was firmly seated, Bicardra bound his hands to the reins while Wiley covered the horse's eyes. The brothers wished the man a safe journey, whipping the horse's hind end. The horse, blind and terrified, kicked wildly behind it. It let out a yelp before taking off at full speed towards the bluff in front of it. Sam Mason and his gang heard the commotion from above and ran over to investigate. They exited the cave just in time to hear the horse cry out as it felt the ground beneath it disappear. They scrambled out of its way as the captain and his steed tumbled violently down the face of the rocks above them before landing right at the entrance of their hideout. They both died immediately on impact. The entire gang stood in silence at the horror they'd just witnessed. From above them, they could hear the harps laughing maniacally. It was at that moment that Sam Mason realized it would probably be best if he asked the harps to leave. Why not just kill them? I'll do it. I think it'd be probably best if you just killed them, mate, to be honest. Yes, exactly. Like, these are, you've killed innocent people. Just be rid of these dudes. They're clearly bad. Do some of that vigilante justice. Come on. The Brothers Harp. Having been expelled from Sam Mason's gang, the Harps and their families found themselves in a truly desperate situation. They had run out of criminal connections, and it was only a matter of time until word spread that they were once again vulnerable. With nowhere to go, the Harps decided to return to familiar territory. They began the journey south back to their homes in East Tennessee, continuing their crime spree the entire way. In July 1798, the Harps killed a farmer named Bradbury, a man named Harden, and a boy named Coffee. After that, the bodies of William Ballard and several others were discovered disemboweled and thrown into the Holston River. James Brassel and John Tully were discovered with their throats slashed. As they moved into central Kentucky, the Harps came across a family sleeping in their camp and killed them all. They scalped a man named John Graves and his teenage son, then they murdered a runaway slave girl and her captors. The group arrived in Webster County and were given refuge at the home of a man named Moses Steggall. While there, the Harps killed another of the Steggall's guests, Major William Love, and shortly after cut the throat of Steggall's four-month-old child because it would not stop crying. When Mrs. Steggall screamed at the sight of her butchered infant child, they killed her as well. The Harps fled rest from the home after learning that Moses Stegel was gathering a posse to take them down, but fortunately, their luck was about to run out. F***ing finally. Are these guys at last gonna f***ing die horribly, I hope? On the morning of the 24th of August, 1799, after leaving their families camped in a secluded area, Mikadra and Wiley ventured out in the direction of the home of a man named George Smith. They planned to murder Smith and use his home as a hideout until the heat died down. I hope Smith is the legend who finally tortures and kills these guys. However, while en route to Smith's home, Steggall's posse, under the command of a man named John Liper, managed to cut them off at a crossroads. With rifles at the ready, they ordered the brothers to surrender. The Harps did not comply. Instead, the brothers attempted to flee, at which time McCandra was shot in the leg and back. He tried desperately to keep up with Wiley, but he simply could not. No, because he was shot in the back. Ah, good! Liper and Smith rode hard to catch up, and the two were eventually able to pull the wounded man from his horse. Mikaja attempted to swing at Liper with a tomahawk, but he was quickly restrained. Now, I'm not normally one to celebrate mob justice, but if there's ever a person who is more deserving of it, I can't say that I've heard of them. No, f yeah. Mob justice for the win! 
I'm very happy about this. The time has come. It's unknown if Wiley attempted to return to rescue his captured brother, but regardless, it was too late. The Kaja was at the hands of the mob as the men restrained him. Moses Stegel inflicted shallow cart after shallow cart on the captured harp's neck. A dull pocket knife was used to inflict as much pain as possible. Nice. Between cuts, Stegel would demand that the harps confess his crimes, and in the end, he would admit to over 20 murders, although that number is now believed to be between 55 and 135. Holy sh**. Most of the information we know about the Harps' crimes, specifically the ones committed after leaving Nickajack, come from Mikaja Harp's own mouth during his forced confession. After hours of torture, Moses Stegel finally allowed his wife's and child's murderers to die. As a final act of retribution, Stegel finished removing the Harp's head and mounted it at a crossroads near Henderson, Kentucky. The head remained there for decades, and the road to this day is still unofficially known as Harp's Head Road excellent i'm so satisfied about this i know it's i know it's bad to like celebrate someone's murder but f man I, i'm down for that this guy is a horrible piece of shit and he deserved to be murdered horribly my god simon what happened to you <laughs> oh and here we go simon's debate on the death penalty has been well and truly settled this mother f deserved to die <laughs> After narrowly escaping a similar fate, Wiley did not return to the campsite where his wife and children were staying out of fear of being captured. Instead, he rode north to Cave in Rock, where after learning of his brother's fate, Sam Mason allowed the younger Harp to remain at his camp. Without the influence of his older brother and now going by the name John Seton, Wiley was able to abide by Sam Mason's rules and live with him for at least four years. <laughs> Slightly disappointed by this. <laughs> In 1803, the U.S. government decided to pour some actual resources into rounding up those pesky pirates, and the majority of Mason's gang was captured in a raid. However, Hart Mason, a fellow gang member named Peter Alston, were able to escape. The three fled to Mississippi, but were eventually captured when Harp and Alston attempted to turn in Sam Mason's severed head in order to collect his bounty. It's not known whether Mason was killed by the two or died from injuries sustained during their escape, but it didn't matter. In January 1804, Wiley, Harp, and Peter Alston were executed by hanging and thus ends the story of the bloody harps. Good, they're both dead. Excellent, it took way too long. Some notes, as we call them here, Matthew, by the way, dismembered appendices. <laughs> Because this story takes place over 250 years ago, there's some level of uncertainty that surrounds almost every aspect of the Harps' legacy. For instance, some later reports believe that the Harp brothers may have actually been the Harp cousins and that their crimes may have begun when they were actually in their 30s as opposed to their teens. In instances like this, I simply had to make a judgment call based on what information seemed most reliable from the sources that I was able to find online. Most sources from the 18th century report them as brothers, so oh, that's what I chose to present to you. Other details, such as specific dates and exact movements, are also up for debate, but that is just the nature of a story that has been passed by word of mouth for over two centuries. Shortly after Mikaja's death in 1799, Susan Wood and Marie Davidson were apprehended and taken to Russellville, Kentucky to answer for their crimes. However, after the circumstances of their decade-long imprisonment by the Harps were revealed, the women were released good. Both women later remarried and changed their names to avoid being associated with the Harps and their crime spree. Smart choice there. It's believed that other women were held captive by the Harps at various times throughout their lives. However, details about those women, including their names and eventual fates, are unknown. Because of this, I chose to focus on Susan and Maria, as the Harps most likely considered them to be their real wives, while any others were simply sex slaves. One notable exception is a woman named Sally Rice, who is believed to have been tricked into marrying Wiley in Knoxville, Tennessee, while the brothers lived in the area. She was unaware of the brothers' living conditions until after the ceremony, and upon learning of the other women who shared at her new husband's home and bed, attempted to escape. She was not able to, however, and instead continued to live with them until Mikaja's death, at which time she returned to her father's house in Knoxville. She's believed to have given birth to a single heart child during this time. Well, it's just a little bit of extra grimness to add on to today's already horribly grim episode. Thank you, Matthew, for your first ever Casual Criminalist script. It was, uh, I enjoyed this. Very historical, which makes a little bit of a change for Casual Criminalist. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Uh, if you did as well, please do like, subscribe. If you're listening to this in its podcast form, why not leave me a review?